Okay, um, and um, well, I will actually go back a step from what we have heard in the last two um, talks, where actually it was very complicated about already the coupled uh, states in a, in a chain. Uh, and I will speak about these uh, single magnetic impurities and um, about uh, the Shiba states that you can find there. Um, and actually I'm also very uh, thankful to, to Leonid that he was uh, already presenting such a detailed introduction to the occurrence of these uh, Shiba states on by magnetic atoms on a superconductor. So I will not go into the, into the theory, but um, I will kind of put this experimentalist view and this kind of PowerPoint physics of what's happening. So um, what we are looking at, and I will just try first with this kind of classical picture of what, what's going on. So if you put a um, magnetic atom on top of a superconductor, there may be some um, exchange interaction, and actually that's creating this, this scattering potential that we have uh, heard about. And um, that, um, if you first look at your, your, your density, your quasi-particle density of states of the substrate, then actually by this uh, magnetic interaction that you see here, you create these Shiba states. And they are, they are located inside the gap. And we've always heard that there's like one Shiba state in the gap. But of course, what you measure is also that you see its second pair of it, because you have a kind of uh, electron hole symmetry. However, there will be um, a difference in the intensity, as we have also heard. That's kind of the, the, the wave function of your, of your Shiba state that you have. And most typically in the experiments, it's like that, that the one with the, with the highest intensity actually defines really the Shiba state. And the other one is just the replica that you see due to the um, electron hole symmetry. So um, we can then detect the Shiba states. And actually, depending on this uh, magnetic scattering potential strength, you will find then the Shiba states at different energetic positions inside the gap. So for example, then um, in this case, we even find this higher intensity one. So the Shiba state um, in the um, um, hole-like density of states. So then if you compare to the state that we had seen before, actually you would have crossed already um, a quantum phase transition because of this different interaction potential. So what we are interested in, so you have these states inside the gap. We are going to probe them with uh, tunneling spectroscopy at, at 1.2 Kelvin. Um, and what we question ourselves is actually about these transport mechanisms that um, you can observe when you, when you try to detect these states. So now in this classical limit, this looks very easy, but actually you have to be a little bit more careful because it's not only that you have interactions um, like locally with a classical spin, but you could have also interactions due to your many body physics around. So at the same time, if you have some exchange coupling strengths, you also couple to the kind of electron-like state, so you also have a condo state. And the question is now, so which, if you have one kind of magnetic coupling strength, which is now your ground state? And we can speak about these two regimes. Um, if your coupling strength is strong, you're actually in this regime where condo screening really dominates, and all over you have the condo screened case. On the other hand, if your coupling is a little bit weaker, then you actually remain with a local spin on the surface, and this is kind of the, the free spin state. And I'm, I'm sure that also Rox Zitko will speak about this, this later. So this is one thing that you need to, to figure out in which regime you are. But then actually you can go even a little uh, uh, more forward, and we want to now change the spin. So most of the experiments, they, they consider that you have a spin one half system. But if you had, for example, a system where your spin state is a little higher, and if you also introduce an isotropy in your system, as it is, for example, done by a molecule, then if you just think in this picture of that you have your, first of all, degenerate um, MS values, then you could have due to magnetic anisotropy. You, uh, well, of course, you have your splitting, your zero field splitting of these states. So um, we have heard that already a couple of times in this conference, so I will only go through this very uh, quickly. But actually the question is if you can detect fingerprints of this magnetic crystalline anisotropy in the Shiba states, and actually I would like to refer to this uh, publication by Rock, who's actually predicting this theoretically, that there should be fingerprints um, in the spectra. So in which systems are we going to look at it? So we have these two uh, pictures. One of them would be the transport. And here we also look at single atoms only. So these will be manganese atoms on top of a um, lead surface. And then in the second part, well, of course, we need to have a system where we have um, anisotropy. So we will look at molecules. And these will be magne uh, manganese phthalocyanine molecules. Everything is done on the lead uh, 111 substrate. So we don't have this preferential orientation uh, and or, uh, along some chains. Um, and uh, as I said, it's done by STM at 1.2 Kelvin. 
So let's come to the first part. And um, we, we measure on, on lead. So this has this critical temperature of 7.2 Kelvin. And this is, has only an energy gap of 1.35 milliEV, as we have actually heard in the, in the previous talk. So this is our density of states, what it looks like. And now what we do is we measure the superconducting tips because we really rely on the higher energy resolution. So if you only measure at 1 Kelvin roughly, you still have thermal broadening if you have a metal tip. And um, that smears out, of course, due to Fermi-Dirac statistics, your, your energy resolution. But if you cover also your, your tip with uh, this superconducting material, so just by dipping it into the surface, or actually, as we heard previously, that happens already also occasionally otherwise. So we make sure that uh, we do it properly, so to have really the bulk um, properties. And then we do our DIDV spectroscopy. And then this is the, the typical spectra that we get on a LED 111 surface. So here, um, of course, you have to now be careful in the interpretation. What you see, if you put, uh, uh, look at these energy scales, of course, you have a doubling of the gap because you also have now the replica of the gap uh, in the tip. So you have to be a little bit careful more in the interpretation of the spectra and where your energies are. So now, um, if you had Shiva states here, so they are just uh, uh, sketched by these little bars here. If you're very far away, um, the tunneling would be just dominated by single electron tunneling. So uh, in this kind of power point physics, what you do is that at this energy, you have uh, enough uh, energy due to your alignment of the fermi levels with respect to each other, that an electron can, for example, tunnel from the tip to the substrate and actually goes into this, this Shiba state. But uh, actually then you may think that, well, there's, there's a problem because now you are in one kind of localized state, which is inside the energy gap, and you have really changed the occupancy of this particular state. So the question is, how do you get rid of this electron? Because a second electron wouldn't be able to now tunnel into this state. So, well, we are at finite temperature. So what you could assume is that there's actually some relaxation. Actually, it's a thermal relaxation, as we can show. Um, and, and then, of course, this state is emptied and the next electron can come. So when you're very far away of your tip, then you could describe this in this single electron picture because this rate um, is fast enough so that then when the second electron comes, it's already emptied. And then the, the, the current that is associated to it, of course, just scales with the tunneling amplitude squared and with this uh, relaxation rate that you have here from the Shiba state into the quasi-particle continuum. Well, um, if you go now and decrease the tip sample distance, actually um, your tunneling rate will be faster and faster and at some point um, you may not even be able to empty the state so quickly anymore. But because you are on a superconductor, there's this other transport mechanism which are Andreev reflections. So no, now you can go into this regime and actually these are resonant Andreev reflections because you go through a Shiba state. So basically you transfer an electron but then um, you actually do this Andreev reflection, so you reflect a hole and you put a kind of Cooper pair into the substrate and this actually doesn't change the occupancy of the state, so now you're not limited anymore by any relaxation mechanisms. However, if you look into the tunneling um, current, then of course now it depends, just imagine, I mean an electron has to go down here, so that would, this probability will scale um, with t to the square, but then actually you have to go back again, and this is the reason why all this process is scaling with the tunneling amplitude to the power of fourth, so it's much more unlikely when you are far away, but actually when you are close, because there's no term which is determining somehow in a relaxation mechanism, you can come into this, um, efficient, to this regime very efficiently. Now, previous STM experiments, they basically rely on the fact that your tip is very far away, so when you look into this, this first paper about uh, Shiba states on a superconductor, um, so this was the bare um, gap, and then you see that here you have a variation when you measure over a magnetic atom, then it was always interpreted that, okay, you have Shiba states, so basically you change your density of states. And also this, this later publication by the Shui group, they also they, they, they measure now at lower temperature, but you can see clearly these states inside the gap, but they are always kind of interpreted in this density of states um, picture. Well, um, let's now go to, to our um, experiment. So we have deposited manganese atoms on the LED 111 surface. So you can see here these tiny protrusions. And this is what a typical differential conducting spectrum looks like. So it looks very crowded, what, I s what you see here. But we just want to uh, focus on the main um, aspects. So the first part is, of course, that you see this, this gap edge. So when you have your energies aligned of these two BCS kind of density of states, then you have a contribution here. And this is this dark gray area where we have these BCS-like density of states. 
So we ramp our, our energy, now we, we do hit one of these Sheba states, and actually in this case you can see not only one Sheba state, but actually many of them, but I just want to point out that we are now in this regime of uh, tunneling into the Sheba state, and because we are at finite um, temperature, you also see states um, inside an energy window of plus minus delta, which is actually only the gap of the tip, and you do see states there because you do have thermal occupation of these states. And this means that you always have symmetry, so this state is symmetric around this um, delta of the tip, and this is just a kind of replica due to the finite temperature effect. So, now we do look at these manganese atoms at kind of different distances between the, 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 the tip and the manganese atom, and these are a set of uh, just uh, three spectra taking at different junction conductances, the number of the co junction conductance you can find here. And what I would like to point out is that you see already here the problem in interpreting the Sheba states as the density of states because, well, when you're far away, so you're really in the tunneling regime, then you see that, for example, this Sheba state has a very, very high intensity. Now you, and its um, yeah, whole symmetric state is lower in intensity, so you have a certain asymmetry here in the peaks. Now you go closer and you already see in the blue spectrum these two peaks are almost of equal height and when you go even closer they have inversed their intensity. So for sure this picture fails that you can interpret the, the, the Sheba state intensity as a density of states. So well, this, yeah, these are the, the uh, spectra in different regimes and now we, we do it not only three spectra, I've just picked them for illustration, but you can now take out and, uh, your DIDV intensity at all these different sample distances and actually you plot it as a function of the normal state conductance, so just well outside of the gap. So, and, and if you plot this intensity of, you, we plot only the, uh, the Sheba state at positive and uh, negative energy, so you can see at some point when you are far away, so for example this state at negative energy was higher in intensity, and then first of all, when you approach, of course, all of them in this logarith double logarithmic plot, they just increase uh, linearly, <coughs> as you expect, because you're just coming closer. But then, actually, what you can see is the, the intensity they level off, both of them, and you can see here this crossover point where really now the, the intensity of these two states, they, they invert. So, what can we learn from this uh, kind of spectrum? And, well, just this to remind you of this old picture, so we are really far away, we have the single electron tunneling, the electron comes into the Sheba state and it gets relaxed. Then we come closer and this is still not the rate limiting step, but when we are at some point very close that this emptying is too, too uh, 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 slow, then we have actually the contribution of this other, of this Andreev reflection that sets in. And this, um, of course, has, as I said, a lower probability, and this is why all these um, curves, they level off. Okay, well, you could also check on that. If this is a uh, rate-limiting step, and this is a thermal excitation or thermal relaxation of the state into the continuum, then, well, the question would be just measure it in other temperature to really prove that this is um, this. And uh, so we increase our temperature to 4.5 Kelvin, and this is exactly the same kind of analysis. And if you look closely, so before we had here this, this uh, leveling off at um, junction conductions uh, that you can really read off very well. But at 4 Kelvin, actually, it's pushed to a point where we cannot even reach this, this sublinear regime anymore, and we cannot really reach um, the, the kind of crossover point. So the reason of that is, of course, that because at higher temperature, this relaxation rate is much more efficient, so you have to be able to go even, even closer to uh, actually come to the regime where now the Andreev process has to be the um, more dominant uh, process in the tunneling. So you can also do some more um, quantitative analysis of uh, what is happening for these relaxation rates. So at 1.2 Kelvin, we can get this relaxation rate actually from this leveling off of the um, uh, junction conductances. So this has actually been um, modeled very nicely by the group of uh, Felix von Oppen and his uh, PhD students Falko Pientka and Yang Peng. And actually these guys you've already seen in the first talk this morning. Um, and at 4 Kelvin, it's much easier to take out the um, relaxation time because that is still limited in that regime um, that we can see it in the peak width and you really see an order of orders of magnitude difference here in these uh, relaxation processes. And this is of course also the proof that it's a thermal process. 
Okay, so now that we have understood these different transfer me mechanisms, what happened? Um, well, of course, when you're far away, then we can uh, assume that this is a density of states effect. And this is something that we will use now in the following um, picture. So we keep now in the following, the always very far away, so that our um, Shiba states are in this limit of um, density of states interpretation. And now we are going to look at these molecules. So, as I said at the beginning, we wanted to see if there are effects of magnetic anisotropy. So, why we choose this molecule then? Well, so the here we have not just a single manganese atom, but it's surrounded by this stylocyanine cage. And this makes that you have a level splitting and you actually introduce magnetocrystalline um, anisotropy. And furthermore, because you have this organic skeleton around, of course you can image single molecules, but you can also observe islands. And as I will show you later, here you have an almost square-like lattice sitting on the uh, lead substrate, and that gives rise to different interactions due to different adsorption states. So um, here I just show you some of the data taken on one particular molecule. As for a reference here, we show the lead um, spectrum in the background. And now we measure on one of these molecules. And if you look into the differential conductance, you, of course, see clear differences. So you do see Shiba states. And you see them, of course, well inside the gap. And uh, so this, of course, tells us there is a magnetic interaction. And if we look very closely, so here I put a zoom on this particular um, spectrum here on the right-hand side, you can see that actually these are always three peaks. And they have, um, well, actually well-defined energies with respect to each other, as you will find out in the following. So we don't only have one molecule at hand, but we have this lattice of molecules. So we take many different spectra on different molecules. And here is the color plot of these differential conductance spectra. And now, so the high intensity here are always these Shiba states inside the gap when the Shiba states are very far away. You don't have any thermal excitations at one Kelvin. So these spectra are kind of clean. And now we sorted the, the spectra in a way that you um, see that these Shiba states are shifting into the gap. So basically this means we have an increase increasing magnetic coupling strength. I just plot here three spectra that are taken at these particular three lines. So actually this is the one that I was showing before. Here at this point we see the Shiba state there really directly at delta. And then we are even further down here. You can see then this inverted uh, intensity of the, of the Shiba state. Yes? I don't know who was first. Sebastian. Sorry, by, by how we sort them. So now this is just an arbitrary scale in the sense of the highest intensity is um, now always on the negative side and then how it moves this highest intensity peak uh, further inside the gap. And at some point we have the highest intensity even um, in, the, in the whole like state. This is how we sort the spectra. Intensity. intensity. So here you can see here this, this uh, well, the, the, the position, but of the highest intensity peak because I mean, if you look into the spectrum now, we, so we take the position of this, so basically the average weight of where this peak would be. And then, um, so here you see that this energy is shifting through, but we wouldn't be able now, if I, I just wanted to point out, we take the higher intensity one, so this one instead of this one. And then, okay, here, of course, when they are in the middle, it's different, uh, difficult to discern them. But then here you have the higher intensity on the right-hand side. So the intensity, but of course the energetic position. I guess it's the same question. Uh, so the y-axis there is not something that you're changing experimentally? No, this is... You're just, it's just a plotting. It's just a plotting. So like this is like 140 spectra of mo different molecules and we just sorted them. And uh, that corresponds to some kind of... Because they shift now to uh, increasing coupling strengths, but it has no scale. It has, it's just the number of, of spectra which determine the, the size of this, this plot. All the states are energy above the gap? Um, well, they are, so because this is, we, we measure again with the superconducting tip inside of delta plus minus tip, you shouldn't see anything. So they are basically, um, they are inside the energy gap of the substrate. Okay. But because the gap of the tip is shifting everything oh, by delta, okay, okay. Um, they are here. So actually the energy of two delta would be this line here. Uh, no, sorry, actually it's... it's, it's probably yeah, okay. So... Um, Good. Any other questions? So we have now these, these set of spectra and um, well, of course, now I just put them kind of in a way to, to, to see where, where kind, what kind of spectra we have. 
Um, but actually, how to relate them, why the different mo uh, the molecules are different, actually we find that, so this is the, the topography of these islands on top of the light surface. But if you, if you measure at constant height at a particular energy, so you basically have only contributions of certain Sheba states, then you will see that only some of these molecules are actually bright because they have Sheba states at lower energies and the other ones are dark. And the, the idea for doing this is just to find out if there's a pattern on how these molecules are sitting on the surface. And if you look, you can find some kind of repetition. So the zigzag, so believe that there's a Moiré structure because you have a square lattice sitting on top of a hexagonal lead 111 substrate. So that means that every molecule is sitting in a slightly different adsorption site until you have a repetition about, I think these are like 12 molecules in this direction and two in that direction, roughly. So, well, this, this is just given by, by, by the system that we have this due to this, to this um, self-assembly. But now, what, what is interesting nevertheless, so you have your different adsorption uh, strengths and states, and what you see is that, well, you just nevertheless always have this characteristic splitting. So if you look at how these uh, uh, states kind of shift through the gap, as I plotted here, it's always this triplet. Um, and, um, well, as I said, we have sorted them due to the um, energetic position of the states, but taking the one with the higher intensity. So, of course, we have this regime up here where the high intensity Shiba state is a negative energy. Then we have this, this crossing here um, where you actually go through this quantum phase transition. And then we have the energies, uh, the Shiba states at positive energy down, down here. So here's just the plot again so that you can really nicely see the deconvoluted spectra. So now we subtract the influence of the superconducting energy um, gap. So you can then really read off the energetic position of the Shiba state as a real uh, value. Okay, so what um, I said that we wanted to understand this, this correlation. So you have also many body effects going on. So you don't only have the Shiba state, but you also have the, the um, condo coupling strength. And what um, we had measured uh, previously is that you can see um, uh, the, the, the condor resonance um, and actually correlate the width of this, this condor resonance, this small uh, peak that you can find here. Um, you plot here as your x-axis and corresponding to that, because you measure on each and every single molecule, the condor um, width of this peak and the position of the Sheba states, and then you can find this characteristic um, relation. And, uh, well, actually, this fits very much these very early theories. And uh, what I would like to point out here, what you assume then is that down here, when your Shiba states are at positive energy, as I have defined my regime, you are in the condor screen uh, case, you have a strong coupling strength J, while above here, you have crossed this and have gone to the free spin state uh, where you don't fully screen um, your spin on the, on the surface. So, well, the question is how to understand this in this picture of um, uh, uh, the molecular state. So, because we have this um, quadratic ligand field, actually we split up the D levels, and this um, in the 2 plus oxidation state gives rise to a spin of 3 half in the gas phase. Now, the question is what happens when you put this molecule on the surface? <coughs> and, um, well, if you look into a very simple picture of your D levels, that you have actually the, due to the extension of the dz square, it is strongly hybridized um, with the substrate. And this one uh, is actually the state that really gives rise to the um, Sheba states and the, the condo screening. And then um, the question is what happens to, to this spin here. And then we look here in this uh, theoretical paper by David Jacob. And they say that um, in principle, because you have your organic ligand, actually you have an interaction there. So you have a total singlet state here. So in the total spin, actually, we can disregard uh, this um, spin. And what we are left with then is another spin that's here in the, the dxy orbital due to its extension. It's very weakly hybridized with the substrate, so weak that we do not see any sign of a Sheba state. However, what's important now is that we actually end up with a total spin of one of this molecule on the lead surface. So um, let's uh, now go to the fact that we have this uh, ligand field around it. So you may ask for the anisotropy in the spin one state. So of course, if you have no magnetic anisotropy, your plus minus one and zero state are degenerate. If you switch on actual anisotropy, I think we don't have to go into the detail on this in this conference because we've heard it. Then you split up the pl uh, plus minus one and zero states. Then you would get two states, of course. 
But if you switch on also some uh, uh, transverse anisotropy, you have this mixing of states that we have seen earlier. And then you split up your spin one state actually in three uh, non-degenerate states. So do we see this uh, in the uh, experiment? And uh, for that, I would like to take you to the process of how we measure again the Shiba state. Basically, what you have is you have a ground state. And once you measure it, it's a resonant process. You have for a short time an electron. Um, so you go to this excited state. Now, if we are in the case, so I, we start with a spin one molecule. And actually, in the, I plot here these two spins. And one of the spins in the dxy orbital was very weakly hybridized with a substrate, so it always persists. So this is what we call the k equals 2 channel. Now, the other one is interacting with the substrate, so it does give rise to Shiba state and to Kondo. So if we are in the Kondo screened regime, then I just plot this as this Kondo screening cloud around. So basically, this spin is also screened away. So the total spin is the spin 1 half, which persists from this um, DX spin in the dxy orbital. Now, if we do probe our Shiba state, what, is, uh, what we do is so we have this, this excited state. And now if this excited state, we go from a spin 1 half to spin 1 case, but we do have now an anisotropy splitting of these spin 1 excited states, you can actually access these three states that I've just introduced before by this anisotropy. So this is the attachment of this other electron. And this is exactly what we see in the experiment. So here's the, the full spectrum, or just one, one zoom here on this state. So we here are in the, in the condo screen regime. We see these uh, three peaks. And you see these transitions um, to the um, excited states. But then, just compared to Delta and this vertical, the, distance, the, the red line and the black lines? Uh, this is not scaled. No, I just want to point. So, so this. So, so basically, this is um, EB when you take this weight. So here you have the binding energy of these three Shiba states. And then delta, actually, so you excite. And this is a much higher energy. So basically, here, this would be the binding energy of this state. This is the second one. This is the third one. So you can see that this distance is, of course, much larger. So this is the real kind of density of states uh, plot that we have on the surface. And we excite, so we access this state this Shiba state, then this one, then this one. These are the three that we see here. But for some reason, this D and E are small compared to delta? Yes. So actually, I so should point this out. So um, yeah, because everything is renormalized. And I hope that uh, <laughs> actually Rock is going to speak about that. So this is not the actual size of the anisotropy in the molecule. So you would expect, as you're completely right, I should have mentioned that before. You, sh you can expect actually anisotropy energies that are up to milli EV ranges so that you are in the range of delta. But because you have this many body interaction with the substrate, everything gets scaled down. So then the splitting is much smaller. And for a theoretical analysis, I guess I can refer to, to Rock for the details. We just say it's, I mean, we cannot now from that draw a conclusion on the real anisotropy splitting, just that it's there. Yeah? <coughs> Yes, because you add an electron on this electron. So it's not like an inelastic excitation where you go in and go out, but you have for a short moment this one electron. So that means that you have to change by plus minus one half. Okay, so this is the regime where we have screened this, this channel. So we had these Shiba peaks on the left-hand side of the Fermi energy. And now, of course, what we have to analyze is what's happening on the other side. So we are looking basically into these spectra now. So in that case, the condo screening also of this channel is very weak. So there's some kind of spin persisting. This is the free spin case. So now in the ground state, if you look into these two spins, um, is a total spin one. So now you actually split the energy levels of your ground state. And now if you look into the Shiba states, you do excitations to the excited states. And again, because you change it by plus minus one half. So you go to the excited state, which is now spin one half. As you can see here, you attach this electron, you go through this Shiba state here. So then you end up with this, this um, total spin one half. So now you have these three transitions. And actually, well, you measure these three transitions, but um, there's something that you may realize already here, is that when you look into the intensity um, or the weight of the peaks here, you can clearly see that this one has a much lower intensity than this black one here. While in the spectra before, they looked actually similar. So we now plot this um, 
um, this um, relative peak intensity, so to say, yeah, of all of these um, three peaks as a function of the position where these peaks are. So below the Fermi energy here, we are in the condo screen um, case. So we look at this particular um, arrangement here. And uh, well, if you look at it, basically all the peaks are of equal, roughly equal intensity. And um, well, actually in this um, picture, it ac makes sense because you have this one ground state and then only you can excite to all of these states, but actually your transition probability is just um, given by the fact that you can access all of these states equally well. So the intensities are roughly the same. However, in this case, I mean, um, we only have access to a very small uh, distribution of these states. But if you look here, actually you have a clear uh, intensity distribution. So you have all these black peaks down here and then the red ones in the middle and the blue ones up there. So your intensity basically of this black peak is very small. So this is the transition from this state to this excited state. Now, why is this the case? So, because we still measured finite temperature, we measured one Kelvin, and these energy separations is just roughly in the area of 100 microelectron volts. You do have a thermal population of these states, and this is what is indicated um, here. So, because you have a higher population of this, uh, 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 really, the ground state, then you govern the transition probability by its occupation, and the other states, because they are higher intensity in, in, in energy, they have less occupation. So everything is governed by the transition probability because you have now actually less states or occupied states here before that you can excite. So the question is if this really, this intensity distribution really follows a the thermal occupation. And we can only plot now this, this peak separation as a function of this, the intensity as a function of peak separation. And these are these, the experimental points that we see here. Well, they are very much scattered, but you clearly see uh, a tendency. And um, just as a guide to the eye, because we measure at 1.2 Kelvin, if you put here the Boltzmann statistics, that would be the line. So you can say that it actually roughly follows it. So we do know that we have this um, uh, population of the states. And actually, this also clearly tells us that this is the right assignment of the quantum ground state, because in the one case, we had only this one level, um, in the, and we were in the condo screen case. The other spin was completely screened off. You had only one level as the ground state. And in this case, you are in the free spin case, so you have a total spin one, and you have a thermal occupation of these lines. So with uh, this, I would like to come to the end. So in the first part, I have looked at very basic <laughs> properties of actually uh, when you access this Shiba state, how does it happen? So on the one hand, you have the single electron tunneling picture, but this is at some point restricted to the fact that you change the occupancy of the Shiba state and you have to empty it to be able to tunnel into it with the next electron. And well, if you go to actually strong tunneling coupling strengths, then you do come into the regime where the NDF reflections become important. And secondly, then when we understand these Shiba states, we can play a little bit more with it. We can see uh, the coupling strengths on different adsorption sites, but actually we even resolve uh, magnetic anisotropy splitting. And by that, we can clearly identify the quantum ground state because of the particular characteristics of these occupation transition probabilities due to thermal occupations. With this, I would uh, like to, to thank the people who were involved in this work. So in this first part, for the tunneling into the Shiva states. Uh, this is Michael Rubi as a PhD student and Benjamin Heinrich as a postdoc. And then you have seen already, we had a very uh, nice collaboration with the, with the group of Felix von Oppen. So they did all this theoretical modeling to this and the, his PhD students, Falko Pientka and Yang Peng. And the uh, work on the manganese thalocyanine was uh, the PhD work with, from Nino Hatter, again guided by Benjamin Heinrich, so you see more often in this work of the superconductors. Michael Ruby also helped out with that, and this was also still done together uh, with Nacho Pascual, who then, of course, moved to, to San Sebastian, but we have a really uh, good collaboration over the years, and, well, thank you for your attention. <laughs>